Anyway, tonight the, the, the title of this sermon is Guarded, Faithful, and Sent. Guarded, Faithful, and Sent. And those are going to be some of the three major topics that we go through tonight is being guarded, being faithful, and being before we jump into uh, those topics, uh, we are in this series in First Peter. We're going to be in this series for about 10 weeks church-wide. This is week number two. So we've got a few more weeks after this, two months actually after this. And we're just going to walk through uh, verse by verse. And we're going to learn what uh, God has for us through this book that is written by the apostle or uh, also known as the disciple Peter or formerly known as Simon. And what we know this side of heaven, what we know this side of eternity is that Peter was a disciple, that this was about 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the church has been growing for 30 years while Jesus has been seated at the right hand of the Father. And Peter has this longing, is kind of what we see in these letters, for this uh, eternity. But what we know from this is that there's some tensions that Peter is walking through. And the tensions that Peter is walking through are, uh, is the fact that Christianity is about to become illegal. Christianity is about to become illegal in the entire known world by Rome. They are persecuting people. They are pushing the Christians out of their home states, their home cities. And they are now in this thing called the dispersion. And they are hiding. They're being persecuted, some being killed. We've seen in Acts early on in the book of Acts that uh, an, apostle, uh, an apostle or a, a disciple, a believer named Stephen is stoned. And this isn't even by the Romans. This is just by the Jewish people. And so this has grown, uh, this persecution has grown in massive proportion. And in light of that, in light of this persecution, Peter says, be faithful. Peter says, long for heaven. You have this living hope. You are born again. And he tries to encourage this, this, uh, this scattered out church by this letter that would be like is that if someone came in and said Christianity was illegal and you guys all had to go run and hide uh, somewhere across the United States some of you in Montana and Seattle and here and there and then all of a sudden you got a letter from me saying hey just be encouraged I know this is hard right now like you'd be like uh, yeah it's hard right now but we learned last week that Peter uh, calls into light he says hey look don't live in this past. Don't live in this past that you have where you were once lost. Hey, you were found. Hey, you were once a sinner. Now you are righteous. He says, live in this present reality that you are saved by the grace of God. Jesus has sanctified you by his blood and the Holy Spirit is continually moving in you and the Father is uh, leading you in all of these things. He says, live in this present reality but with this future hope. And the future hope is eternity. And we actually ended with these verses last week, verses three and four. And that's where I want us to start this week. First Peter 1, three through four says this, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. So Peter starts by saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This in Hebrew, I'm not going to botch the name. I'm just going to read it. Shimoneb Eshra, this, this phrase, blessed be God, is this Hebrew phrase, and the Jews would have known it. It would have been all throughout the Old Testament. And what I love about this one phrase here is this is, this is a phrase of inclusion. Peter is writing to a church that is uh, made of all sorts of people, former Jews, uh, former Gentiles who became Jews, then became Christians, and then former Gentiles who just became Christians. And he writes to these people all as one group. He doesn't point out, hey, Jews, blessed be God because of this. Hey, Gentiles, blessed be God because of this. Hey, God fears, blessed be God because of this. He writes this in such a way that it includes all peoples and all nations in this, in this dispersion. He says, blessed be the God of, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter where you're going. It doesn't matter your skin color. Skin color. It doesn't matter any of that. He's all our Lord. What does matter is the fact that we are all sons and daughters of a heavenly Father who sent Jesus for us. And that's just the little bit extra. That's just a sidebar. Blessed be the God, our Father. This statement of inclusion. And then he jumps right in. He says, according to this mercy, we have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. And he starts to talk of salvation. He starts to talk about this great mercy. And we'll kind of jump into this towards the end of our sermon as well. But he starts to talk about this mercy that God has for us. What is mercy? Mercy is getting something or or not getting something we actually deserve. And so what is it that we as people deserve? Well, uh, we all deserve death. And if you've never heard that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but we all deserve death. Why? Because we all have sin in our lives. He says, according to his great mercy, the fact that we are all drawing breath this very moment is the very graciousness and the very merciful acts of the Father and Jesus Christ who could have smitten us with a lightning bolt all in one moment and could have just wiped us out and started fresh and new. But it says, no, he had great mercy for us. And if you don't think you're a sinner, let's just walk through uh, something. I, I heard a pastor do this once. He, he gave his church a Ten Commandment pop quiz. And don't worry, you're not going to be uh, graded officially on this, but I'm just going to walk through some of these things and we'll see. All right, I'm going to give you the easy one. All right, raise your hand if you've never made a carved idol. If you've never made a carved idol, raise your hand. I don't think I've ever made a carved idol. This is like the layup. Everybody should have this one. This means you made like a little god yourself, and then like you put them on a pedestal. You've never done that. That's great. We're all like one out of ten in the Ten Commandments. What about this? What about this? How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand on this one, have ever taken the Lord's name in vain. This is a a pretty bad thing. You don't have to raise your hand on this one. That you would curse his name, you would use his name in a curse, you would use his name flippantly, uh, or anything like that. Most of us start to get the answer wrong. How many of you have ever put anything before God at any point for any amount of time, even just a second, Mm. What about this one? How many of you have actually kept the Sabbath holy? That you didn't do any work, didn't do anything, uh, but praise God on the Sabbath day, which for us would be Sunday. Probably missed that one too. How many of you have ever dishonored your parents? Oh, man. How many of you have ever murdered somebody? Come on. Come on. You've murdered somebody? Hey, Jesus says, Jesus says this, if you've ever hated anyone, you've ever hated anyone, you've committed murder. And I know every single teenager in this room has hated somebody probably who lives with you, your siblings at some point. How many of you have ever taken anything that wasn't yours and didn't pay for it? Namely, toys and things like that when you're younger. And then when you get older, maybe something from your friend, like a piece of bubble gum, didn't tell them. You know what I'm saying? Anything. How many of you have ever, have ever lied about someone? Mm. Lied about someone. Lied on someone like your brother or sister. She did it. He did it. Ooh. All right. Hit you with this one. Last one. How many of you have ever wanted something that one of your friends had and you were mad and jealous because you didn't have it? It's called coveting, all right? And every person has failed this Ten Commandment pop quiz. If you didn't think you were a sinner before, know right now in this moment, shh, know right now in this moment, all have sinned and fallen short of the glorious standard that God has set. All have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. All 
of us in this room based off of all of our hands being raised. And if you didn't raise your hand at any point, you're a liar. You've committed a sin. You're in the same boat with us now. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God, being rich in mercy, he has a great mercy for us that he would send his son, Jesus, so that what we could be born again to a living hope, talking about this future hope to come, this inheritance of heaven, and he, uh, he'll reference it as another salvation. So when Jesus comes and dies on the cross, we are now saved from our sins. If we, could, uh, if we claim him as Lord over our lives, we are saved the first time. But then there's going to be a second day of salvation where Jesus comes and he cracks the sky and he comes back for his people. And we get to be in eternity with him forever, perfect, not stained by sin anymore, not stained by the world anymore. And he says that this uh, inheritance that we're going to get, this eternity that we're going to get is this, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading imperishable, undefiled, unfading. And I'm not going to get into all the particulars about that. We did that last week. If you have questions about that afterwards, I would love to talk to you more about that. But our inheritance is perfect because God made it and we need it. We need this inheritance. But what do we do until then? How must we wait in the midst of this tension until one day when Jesus comes back? What gives us hope? What gives us comfort? What gives us peace until we get to taste the imperishable, undefiled, and unfading eternity when we sit with Jesus in his new Jerusalem forever? But God does this, 1 Peter 1, 5 through 7. You can write this down. Guard, God guards us and grief. What do we do in the waiting? What do we know in the waiting is that God guards us in grief. First Peter 1, 5 through 7, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter says, who, by the power of God, he's talking to the elect exiles here. He's talking to believers. And so he's calling to us now. He's saying, believer, hear this, is that by the very power of God, you are being guarded. And the word that they use here in the original language, guarded, is not just this idea of like this like mall cop. Okay, it's not this idea of the rent a cop, you know, that's like, hey, no, no, nay, nay, don't do that and have no power at all. The term that they use here is this military term. He's saying God is guarding you. He's standing century over you. He's like got like a 50 cal machine gun ready to blow down the enemy. That's kind of guarding is that he's doing for us. He's standing over us in guard day and night for us. He's not some rent cop No, he's the God of all creation that spoke everything into existence. And he says, in the midst of this tension, in the midst of these trials, in the midst of these troubles where you are grieved, yes, God, st God stands guard over you until the last times. In the text, it's de debated by some scholars on what exactly last times mean, but there's two interpretations, and I actually uh, don't think either are wrong, so I'm going to give them to you. What they think it could mean first is this, is that when worst comes to worst, when there's no hope left and everything has gone awry, God stands guard and watch over you. How many of you have felt the very presence of God in the midst of your deepest and darkest struggles? I have living example of what it is to be guarded by God in the midst of our trials. But then some would say that it would mean the actual last time when Jesus cracks the sky wide open and he comes back for his people. He's guarding us until then. Absolutely. 
Amen. That my God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That he would guard me in the midst of my troubles every day of my life. Write this down. God guards us in bad now and to come. Now and to come. Verse 6. In this you rejoice. Rejoice. Even in the midst of your grief, even in the midst of your trials, he says rejoice. Why? Because guard, uh, God is standing guard over you. He has brought you salvation. He loves you. And he says rejoice now because this today is not our end. COVID is not our end. Rioting and injustice is not our end end. Hybrid school is not our end. No, our end is when Jesus comes back for us, the believers, the saints. So rejoice because until the day he comes, he stands guard over you. Have joy in this rejoice. And then he has this shift in His language at first, he's kind of setting up this very theological thought, this very uh, educated thought. And then he starts to come in with this loving pastor, shepherd, friend side. And he says, rejoice in this, though I know you are struggling. And he starts to share this message of love and truth. He doesn't shake the truth. He doesn't not give them a good theology lesson. He doesn't throw all theology out the window and says like, hey, look, you just do whatever, you know, just do whatever until God comes back. No, he's biblical and he stands on truth and he comes in with love and starts to comfort people. Sidebar, you should be that kind of person. You're a believer if you follow Jesus Christ, if he is Lord of your life, you have a message to share. So share it. Don't throw all of your convictions out the window. Share the message that he's given you. Give truth to people, but love them as well. Love them in the midst of you sharing truth. There's a lot of people who are very turned off to Christianity because people will try to tell them truth, but don't do it in a loving way. Share it in a loving way. Sharing the fact that we can rejoice in God. And then he starts to liken our faith to gold. He says, your faith, dash, more precious than gold. I like the fact that he uses gold here because gold to be purified and to become stronger has to go through the fire, right? So he's likening our faith to having to go through fire to become stronger, to test the genuineness of our faith, like Pastor Kirk talked about on Sunday morning. But I also like the idea of gold because you know what? People love gold, People have worked hard for gold. People have labored over gold just to have it, to get it, to get a glimpse of it, to take it and flip it and sell it and make more money. People have sweated over gold. How much more precious should your faith be to you? How much more precious should your faith be to you that if someone would grind over something so perishable, something that's going to inevitably die out and decay because that's what will happen to gold. It won't last forever. How much more attention and labor and love should you put into your faith? How much more should then you read the word of God that you wouldn't just be satisfied with once a week on a Wednesday when Pastor Braden comes and gives it to you, but that you would go home tomorrow and you would read And you would say, you know what, five minutes isn't enough anymore. And that you would move to 10 and then 20. And then you know what, man, just reading the word is amazing. But man, I've got to start to pray more. That I would only pray over my meals. No, I have to pray and speak to him more because he listens to me. And that would grow. And that worship wouldn't be what happens on Sunday and Wednesday night, but your faith, you would begin to labor over it and you would worship in your car and you would worship with your friends and you would worship at the coffee shop and with your families in your homes. And that you would begin to labor over your faith. How much more precious than gold is your faith to you? Which then moves into this idea of being this faithful servant Point number two, you can write this down. Our faithfulness 
is in following. Our faithfulness is in following. First Peter chapter 1, verses 8 through 9 says this. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you, do not na- uh, though you do not now see him, you believe in him. You rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith that is salvation for your souls. Peter, he was one of the original 12 disciples in this conversation that he's having with these believers 30 years after Jesus has resurrected to be with the Father is very reminiscent of a conversation that Jesus has with another disciple named Thomas. Jesus looks at Thomas, he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Thomas was the one who said, Jesus, I won't believe that he got up out of the grave until I put my hands where the holes are, until I see the scar I won't believe. But what does Jesus do? Does Jesus say, well, all right, and not show him his scars? No. He says, put your hands in it. Feel it. See the scar. Pulls up his shirt where he's gashed by a spear. He says, but blessed are those who have not seen and believed. Every single person who's a believer in this room falls into that category that you have not seen Jesus, yet you believe, yet you love him, yet you follow him. And Peter commends these believers, and he's saying, hey, I saw him and I believed, but blessed are you who have not seen, but yet believe. You still love him, you still believe in him, you still follow him, and you still have the same salvation that I do. And on paper, it doesn't make sense. On paper, to follow somebody that you've never seen, to love somebody who you've never met doesn't make sense. They made an entire show about it on trash television called Catfish, about people falling in love that they've never seen. That's like a popular thing with the millennials and the Gen Zs, that people would fall in love with this idea of something. But yet Peter is calling essentially them blessed. He's like, you've done more faithful acts by following the one that you have not seen, by loving the one that you didn't get to put your hand in the hole or see him crucified for you. It doesn't make sense. But yet you do it and yet you follow faithfully. We talked about this guy who became a believer. He was a murderer. He was a rapist and all of these things, a very nasty man who growled at women as they came to try to share the gospel message. And then they give him a Bible. He starts reading it, and then he gets to this line in the Bible, and I'm pretty sure it's the the line that says, Forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they do. And he, it says, like a five-inch nail to the heart, he felt he didn't know whether if that was the compassion of God or his love. And he says he feels this deep pain inside of his chest because God had touched him. He has a real encounter, though he had never seen, though he was the dirtiest sinner of them all, he could probably say God touched his life and he begins to follow him even though he was on death row, even though he knew he had no no freedom outside the walls because of all the wrongs that he had done. He felt the compassion and love of Jesus Christ in his life. And that's why we follow is because we felt the five-inch nail to the chest of his compassion and his mercy and his love. That's why we follow, write this down, faith does not make sense to the world, but faith makes sense of the world. Faith does not make sense to the world, but faith makes sense of the world. The scriptures say that our faith is folly to a perishing world. It is foolish to those who don't know God because it doesn't make sense. Why would you follow something you've never seen? But it says it is the very power of God in our lives. The believer's lives is the very power of God that we would follow him. What it means is that though it doesn't make sense to the world that we would follow, everything now that we've put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ now makes sense. That we would have a purpose, that we would have love and joy and a mission and a reason to live other than for our own glory. Because let me tell you what, living for your own glory gets old. Living for your own self gets old. Narcissism gets old. Having no purpose in life gets old. 
But when you're in Christ Jesus and you feel love for the first time and when you know what you're supposed to be doing for the first time, it's enlightening. It's freeing. You don't have to wake up and just figure out what you're doing anymore. You know when you wake up that, man, my sole mission is to bring glory to God by loving him forever. And by being in relationship with him forever. And that I can tell my friends the same message and follow Jesus and bring more into the family so that they can taste the goodness, that they can taste the mercy, that they can taste the love. Because here's the reality is that it makes sense of our world when we come to know Jesus. That when we follow him, we would know where we're going But it says to the rest of the world that doesn't believe, the perishing is what he calls them. To the perishing, it is foolishness. We get to taste eternity with Christ and the goodness of Christ one day. But one day they will taste eternity and they won't taste the goodness. They won't see the light that we get to see. They will taste eternity but in judgment. Because the reality is without Christ, we are separated from him for the rest of eternity in full wrath and full judgment. And that is a very sad thing. We talked about last week how we need eternity with Christ. We need it more than anything else on this world. More than a spouse, more than a job, more than kids. We need eternity. More than making a good grade on your test, though that is an important thing. Don't get me wrong. You need to make good grades on your test. You need eternity more. And your friends that are lost need eternity more. They need eternity with Christ more. The reality is that they don't know him. They will be separated from him forever in this place that Jesus uses this word called Gehenna. Gehenna is outside of the city walls. It is outside where people went and they Uh, killed children in idol worship where they burned trash and it smoldered and it was just nasty and dirty and full of filth. The reality is, is that if people don't know Christ, they will be put out in Gehenna, in the place that's smoldering and nasty, outside of the city where God and his people will be. So what? What now? Write this down. We are sent in the Spirit. In light of that, we are sent in the Spirit. First Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring that the person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. In the things that have now been announced to you through those who have preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. What do we do now? in light of having this gospel message, in light of having this salvation. And then Peter starts to begin to talk about the prophets and talks about angels looking into and all of these things. He talks about how the prophets essentially seek Christ and long to see him and they prophesy about him and they declare this path that they should start to follow God, that this Messiah, this suffering servant is going to come and he's going to take away the sins of the world. They start to declare that they have this message. Then Jesus does step onto the scene and John says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. Repent now because the Messiah is here, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then Jesus comes and dies on the cross and then tells his disciples to do what? Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them, teach them. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Go into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Go. The prophets set it up for Jesus. Jesus comes and says, set it up for the rest to come until I come back. Set it up for them. The prophets moved by the Holy Spirit. The disciples moved by the Holy Spirit preach this gospel message. And now we as believers preach this gospel message. We have a job to do because we have friends that are lost and friends that are dying and family members that are lost and family members that are dying. And they need a hope. 
And the only place they can find it is in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. But you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Verse 4. But God being rich in mercy with a great love in which he loved us. But God comes in and he gives us mercy and grace because of his love. And now by grace you have been saved through faith. This is a free gift of God that no man may boast. That we be saved unto good works. And that good work that you're saved unto is telling others about Jesus Christ and him crucified. So that they could have a hope. Because they're dead in their sins. That they could have that but God moment where they would receive his mercy and his grace and his love for the first time. I want to end by telling you a story. Because this thing didn't start with me. This is not a new message that I'm preaching tonight. It did not start with me, and it did not start with Peter. But I'd like to tell you a little bit of my own spiritual uh, heritage. Uh, I was saved when I was about sixth grade. So the youngest people in the room, I was about your age. Uh, and the guy that was in the room, his name was Marcus. And Marcus had been poured into, before he poured into me, I then had a mentor later on before I actually moved here. Uh, I was on staff at a church in Mississippi, and a guy mentored me. He did my, my premarital counseling. He did all those things for me. His name was Marshall. And Marshall was poured into a guy named Ka by, uh, by a guy named Kyle. And Kyle became a believer because his brother became a believer and started to share Christ and weep and pray over his bed at night while he slept. And so Zach pours into Kyle, Kyle pours into Marshall, Marshall pours into me. I start pouring into these guys at my last church named Aiden and Samuel, and those guys follow the Lord. And now I'm standing here on the stage tonight proclaiming the gospel message to you, pouring into you, because this is not a new thing. This didn't start yesterday. It didn't start with me. But because someone ran the race before me and set it up for me and taught me and mentored me, now I can stand here and proclaim the graces and the goodness of God because they were faithful to what God told them to do. Now I can be faithful and do what God has told me to do, and that is share the gospel with you. So who's your one? Who will be the one that when you leave today, you'll go tell? Because just as it didn't start with us, it doesn't end with us. We proclaim until Jesus comes back. I'd ask that you would bow your heads. Hear this. Only God's people are guarded. Only God's people are free from the judgment flames of hell. Only God's people live in a message of hope. So the question for every person in this room is, are you his? Are you in relationship with God? Have you claimed him to be the Lord of your life? You need to know the answer to that question. You need to know the answer to that question. Believer in the room, Right now, are you, are you more consumed with your grief? Have you lost sight of the hope that is to come? Are you struggling with loving him, believing in him, and rejoicing in him because of all the things that are happening? Are you not fulfilling the job and being faithful in what you're called to do? Are you, are you letting others walk by and not sharing this message? Those of you who maybe don't know the Lord, I ask you these questions. Are you consumed in grief right now because of all the mess that is in this world? Do you feel hopeless? Do you long to love and to be loved? Do you long for something to believe in? Do you long for joy? Do you long for a purpose? Would you choose tonight to start and to live in all of those things? Would you choose tonight to start to live in all of those things? Father God, I love you and I praise you and I thank you. God, for the message of the gospel, that I could stand here and proclaim truth. God, in a message of hope and grace and mercy.
God, that I would be a recipient of that same grace and love and mercy. Tonight, I pray that if there's a person in this room that does not know you, God, that they would know you tonight and they would begin a relationship with you and they would have love and a hope. And God, that they would know their purpose tonight. Father God, for all the believers in this place, God, I pray that they would live sanctified, God, that that you would continue to work in them, that you would stir up in them the things that they need to start to change, God, that you would prune them, as your word talks about in John chapter 15, that you would start to make them more like you, that, God, they would produce more fruit from your pruning. Father God, we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray.